All right, guys. So today we're going to take notes on these six kingdoms of life. We're going to go into a little bit more detail than we did today in class when we were doing our crown. So the first kingdom we're going to talk about is the Animalia kingdom. The kingdom Animalia is pretty much animals. This kingdom has all the following characteristics. So for any organism to be considered and classified as an animal, it has to be multicellular, have eukaryotic cells, which we know means that all cells have a nucleus that stores its DNA. They do not all they do not have cell walls. Now we know that some eukaryotes could have cell walls, some could not. No animal cell can have a cell wall. They have some type of nervous system, whether it's extremely advanced like ours with brains and a spinal cord and nerves, or very primitive to have even just a nerve ring in a starfish, or even a way of responding to the environment in a sponge. But every animal has some type of nervous system because we're all multicellular, so therefore we are a little bit more complex. Animals can usually move around and respond to their environment, and most importantly, we consume other organisms for food, which means we are heterotrophic. So go ahead and write all these characteristics under the kingdom Animalia. So here are some pictures. You know, of course, y'all are talking about SpongeBob in class today, but here is what a real sponge look like, looks like, which is probably the most primitive of all animals. It is considered living and it is an animal because it is made up of cells. It responds to the environment. It's heterotrophic. It's multicellular because you can obviously see it. And it does not make its own food. Sponges are what we call filter feeders. So they actually absorb things that go through it, water, and then they take all the food out like plankton, algae, that kind of stuff. Animals can also be very diverse, so something as simple as sponges to then going to worms, to insects like the cricket, to arachnids um, like the scorpion and spider, amphibians, the frog, repti reptiles, the um, chameleon, birds, fish, and then even mammals, which is the wolverine. So an Kingdom Animalia is probably one of the most diverse. So just write a couple examples down. All right, let's go to the kingdom plantae. The kingdom plantae is the plant kingdom. This kingdom has organisms that must have the following requirements. Again, they have to be multicellular, which means made up of more than one cell. They all have eukaryotic cells, which means they have a nucleus, but their eukaryotic cells do have a cell wall. So that is another difference. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. And plant cells do. And you'll definitely learn that when you get into seventh grade. But another thing that makes plants stand out is they can use the sun to make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. So we call them autotrophic. Now notice they do not have a nervous system or anything like that. But they still can respond to their environment. So here's examples of some plants. You know, you have your moss squash, um, a pine tree, grass, bamboo, venus flytrap, flowers. All of these are examples of the plant kingdom. And if you'll notice, they all have color green in them because they are allowed to do photosynthesis. So in every eukaryotic cell in their plant cell, they have a chloroplast, which is an organelle that does photosynthesis. So if we had chlorophyll, we could probably do photosynthesis too, but then we would have to be green. Okay, let's talk about the fungi kingdom. Kingdom fungi is the fungus. Fungus is how you say it. Um, fungus is singular. Fungi is plural. The kingdom, uh, the organisms that belong in the fungus kingdom are usually multicellular. Remember we said there are a few exceptions like yeast and mold. They have eukaryotic cells, and actually their eukaryotic cells do have a cell wall, just like plant cells do. But unlike plant cells, they are not able to make their own food, so they have to obtain energy by breaking down and absorbing things around them. So that is what makes them heterotrophic. 
Now, also, like I said in class, when you see a mushroom, which is the most common fungi example, that is actually the reproductive structure. And here were the gills that we were talking about where all the spores are located. This is just one tiny part of actually the fungus that is deep inside the ground, breaking down lots of nutrients and materials that are getting pushed into the soil. So here are some examples of fungus. Like we have yeast, mushrooms, mold, and we talked about some parasitic fungus. We talked about athlete's foot, and we talked about ringworm. So here's a picture that you can kind of see. Ringworm and athlete foot, like I said in class, it is the exact same species of fungus. We just call it something different when it's on a different body part. And now here is a lichen. And if you'll notice at the, in the front of the school where we have those big rocks, there's actually tons of lichen growing on it. A lichen is actually a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a protista, which is almost like a plant. It's algae and protista together. So we kind of consider it fungus because it is more dominant than the protista, but it actually is two different types of cells living together. All right, so here we go into the hodgepodge kingdom, the protista. The kingdom protista is the protist kingdom. This kingdom is the odds and the ends, like I said. This kingdom is for everything that did not fit into any other kingdom. And just like Julia pointed out in class, that means that this is the factionless kingdom. The kingdom protista has organisms that are usually unicellular, but they do have eukaryotic cells, pretty much meaning they just are not a plant, animal, or fungus but they do have eukaryotic cells, so if they do not classify or fit into the other three groups, we put it into the protist kingdom. So if you'll notice, this is a unicellular organism, and here is the nucleus. Now notice it's green, so most likely it probably can do photosynthesis, so this would be classified as a plant-like protist. So here are some pictures. I know I was naming them all today, and y'all are so confused with some of the things I was saying. A paramecium and an amoeba. These are both animal-like protista. Again, their whole entire body is made up of one cell, but it is eukaryotic. You have euglena, which notice it does have a flagella, but again, it's green, so that's a plant-like protista. You have slime molds which is going to be a fungus-like protista. Now, even though we can see this without a microscope, it's actually, like I told you, a bunch of living organisms living in a colony together, so it is still considered single cellular, along with giant kelp and algae. These are all a bunch of colonial down here. These are all colonial organisms, which is a bunch of organisms living together, which is what allows us to see them because originally they are microscopic. Let's get to eubacteria. The kingdom eubacteria is one of the bacteria kingdoms. There are more organisms in this kingdom than any of the other five put together. So organisms in the kingdom bacteria, you have to be unicellular. And of course, to be in the bacteria, you have to be prokaryotic, which means that they lack a nucleus. So this could be good and bad bacteria, like the healthy bacteria that we can find in yogurt is a very good example of a eubacteria. But like I said, there's other types. There's E. coli. There's salmonella. Have you ever heard of that? There is the helobacter which is what causes ulcers in your mouth, um, gonorrhea, then botulism, which is like Botox, and then nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which is definitely something that is so important to plants to allow them to uh, work through the nitrogen cycle, and oil-eating bacteria. So there's lots of different types of bacteria in the eukaryotic, or the eubacteria kingdom. And then last is archaebacteria. Uh, kingdom archaebacteria is the other bacteria kingdom. Pretty much these are our extremists, our dauntless, if you will. They are single-celled, and they are, of course, prokaryotic. The only difference is they live in very extreme environments to the places that are too hot for other life to exist, too cold, too acidic, too salty. They are our extremists. 
So you have your thermophiles, which are heat lovers. And notice that the vents in the bottom of the ocean floor where magma comes out and the bottom of a volcano. You have our psychrophiles, psychrophi- uh, which are our cold lovers. Our acidophiles, which are our acid lovers. Our methogens, which are our methane makers. Our halophiles, which are our salt lovers. And then, um, I, can't even, I think those are thermophiles too. So pretty much just know that archaea is like you bacteria, except they just are extreme. So I want to review over this real quick before we go. And this is the rest of the classification. So we know that domains are up here. And then we have kingdom. And like the you teach students told you, it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. King Philip came over for green soup. Phylum is the next most general level after kingdom. A phylum is more specific than a kingdom, but less specific than a class. So when we're talking about animalia, grizzly bear, black bear, giant panda, fox, squirrel, snake, sea star, they are all in the kingdom animalia. But the kingdom animalia is broken into two phylums, chordata and non-chordata. Chordata means you have a backbone. So you're either a vertebrate or a non-vertebrate. And notice the starfish was taken out because a starfish does not have a backbone. Then you go to your class. This is where we have our mammal, reptilian, amphibian, fish. And so when we go into uh, mammalia, which is mammals, the snake goes out. Then you go into carnava, which means these are obviously carnivore mammals. Then you go into the family Udisa, which are the bears. You saw which are the land bears and then all the way to a polar bear. So class is more specific than phylum, but less specific than order. And you can kind of see how this is going to go. Order is more specific than class, but less specific than family. Family is more specific than order, but less specific than genus. And genus is more specific than family, but less specific than a species. And then, of course... The species is the most specific level of classification. To be the same species, organisms must be able to reproduce and have a fertile offspring. Fertile means that the offspring is able to reproduce. So with our technology today, you know, people are talking about lions and tigers and like how they like to mix them to make a liger or a tigon. Well, when you reproduce this and you have a liger or a tigon, yes, you actually produce an offspring, but it is infertile, which means it cannot produce anymore, proving that a tiger and a lion, even though they are extremely closely related and probably in the same family, are not the same species. So that gives us to our scientific name. In science, every organism is given its own scientific name. If two organisms have the same scientific name, then they have to be the same species. This uh, organism that I show you here is a puma, panther, cougar, or mountain lion. What do you think? Well, it's actually a trick question because they are all the same thing. Sorry, I didn't mean to click off of that. It's just we these are common names that depends on where you live that you could be called a puma, a panther, a cougar, a mountain lion, but they are all the same species. It is Felis concolor. That is a species name. Genus is Felis and concolor is a species. Okay? So if you need to rewind this Go ahead, but I want to make sure they all understand the six kingdoms and the class and the characteristics and understand the classification from kingdom all the way to species. Y'all have a good weekend and be safe on Halloween.